today is uh, the last module of bias and the variance trade-off. Um, so we talk about bias variance uh, decomposition. We're going to talk about uh, remedies uh, when you um, know it's overfitting and underfitting. And also the other thing really important here is how do you know it overfits or underfits? Okay, so uh, what is this part, this whole theoretical analysis uh, belongs to, uh, if we're looking at our nutshell view, uh, essentially uh, this is about uh, model properties and hyperparameter tuning and model selection. And so, so just to review, I mean, um, what we mean uh, the bias variance decomposition is we can decompose the expected prediction error or expected test error considering all the possible x, y pair uh, from the whole population angle. Uh, it can be decomposed as a summation of bias square plus a variance and plus a noise term called a base error we just can't uh, reduce. So uh, essentially you can tell so this error either comes from buyers or comes or uh, it, it's a comes from the summation of the bias error and variance error. Yeah, so this considers the joint probability of all the possible x, y pairs. And these bias term, I mean, the definition, uh, if you still remember, it's uh, essentially we can use, let's use the parameter uh, views. So you have a true model and uh, so you have a true model and then you have an uh, estimated model and has the from estimation so you have a true model theta and then you have this from estimation i mean the average from the estimation the bias is the differences of the true model versus the average of the model estimated uh, from training data and the variance is the um, the differences of the theta bar, this average from estimation versus um, that specific from your current training data. So this variance is about this, and bias, it's about average model versus the true model. Yeah. And then we uh, just more the intuitive sense to talk about bias is um, like this is the error due to in accurate assumption. So in the end, um, the, your, even the average of your estimation, it's pretty far from the true model. So which means what? Which means your assumption just too far um, away from the truth. Uh, so no matter what you do, you're, you're still very far. Uh, no matter what kind of training, uh, large amount of training data, you're still pretty far. So this means the la large a uh, bias problem. And variance is, so um, because of your model just so sensitive, uh, your data is not enough to control, control the model. And it just, uh, whatever estimate from a specific training data, the randomness um, makes your estimation to be so far, um, or maybe very likely to be very far from the average model. So that means uh, it's uh, that type of error is the variance error. And then we talk about two type of bad generalization, right? So you act, now you know what causes the bad generation generalization. It either is the uh, bias or variance, or, or the, it's actually essentially it's the bias plus variance. Uh, but sometimes bias dominate, sometimes variance dominate. And those cases, bias dominate are uh, the case, uh, it's the underfitting case. And those cases dominate by the variance error are uh, the overfitting cases. Um, so these are two type of bad, bad generalization. So uh, now let's uh, think about um, how do I control this? So now I know there's a bias variance trade-off, right? And um, how can I change my model and to, to change their bias or change their and to change their variance, hopefully uh, I can get a better generalization. So this is really that very important curve. I mean, we uh, we talked like see it's 
So the x axis, if your model complexity can be ordered with this kind of x axis, it's a linear order. So this is my model complexity. I can actually order it into this. And from the easy um, model, go to the complex model. So, so you actually, you know, um, the bias uh, is decrease. The easy model has bigger bias and the complex model has uh, smaller um, bias. So this is the bias term. And the variance term is normally uh, the other uh, way. So the variance is uh, pretty small for the uh, those easy, simply, really uh, rigid model. Yeah, I should actually call rigid model. More rigid, uh, not flexible enough. So the variance is like very small for the rigid model, but pretty large for the complex model. So then because the test error, this expected test error is Sorry, I'm trying to get a different color. Different color. See, I want to get a blue color. So because it's the summation, right? So this is the variance term. And then what you want to minimize is the summation of the two. So what you normally get is some kind of a valley shape. So we can cut this is normally like uh, this is the EP uh, expected test error. So it has this shape, right? Just by definition, you can actually get it. Um, and then we can, so let, let's assume this Y axis is the error, the loss. Uh, error or the loss function. So and what you're looking for is this plateau. Um, plateau that it's pretty good the summation on the summation and it give you pretty consistent lower plateau in this kind of valley shape. And this is essentially uh, how you control model complexity can control the bias variance trade off. All right. And we actually show you this figure um, using this uh, rigid regression because you, you know the truth. So that's why you can calculate the true bias and the variance. And then you also, of course, then you can um, plot this bias quadratic plus the variance. Uh, and then um, this uh, expect actually, in fact, here is cross validation error. And you can also plot it the cross validation error. Cross validation error, it's a very good approximation um, for this bias quadratic plus variance. So in the real world data, you actually cannot uh, plot out the bias quadratic plus variance because you don't know the theta truth, right? You actually do not know the theta truth or you don't know that fx truth. So there's no way um, you get that. So we need approximation. So we use cross validation to approximate that curve. And then using co uh, model complexity, this type of curve called validation curve and to control the trade off. All right. So um, what, what I did not cover uh, is the other. Um, so the another very important factor can control the bias variant trade off is the training size. Uh, this is actually a very uh, advanced topic. And the, the previous uh, plot, I mean, it's very easy to understand that, right? Because we know uh, you can have like, you know, vary the K in the nearest neighbor, uh, vary the lambda in the rigid regression, vary the D in the polynomial regression. It just pretty apparent, right? So let me see if I have that curve. Oh, I don't. So it just, your complexity can be easily ordered in this linear line, in this axis. And those cases, you can use this curve to control. Uh, but however, uh, these, this, um, in a lot of cases, you actually cannot. Um, for example, you're comparing two different group of models, like maybe a naive base model versus SVM model in the classification. 
you actually do not know who is more complex, who's less complex, right? And also, uh, just in many cases, um, it's very difficult to know, to, to order that. So without this kind of curve, how could you know you're overfitting or underfitting? And then this is another kind of curve actually called a learning curve. So essentially, you just uh, vary your, uh, the training portion. You just vary the size, the training data. You plot the validation error and the training error. You see uh, how, they, uh, how they behave when you change the training size. Um, if they are very, very far apart, um, even if you just change the training, uh, you add a lot of training data. So this normally means uh, you are in a high variance regime, which is overfitting. Um, so this actually causes some uh, question, right? So uh, why is, so how do the bias variance trade off dependent on the number of training samples? And this is a very, um, very theoretical topic. So I'm not going to cover that. So intuitively, if you have more training uh, samples, like your n get large, uh, of course your variance got the your mo the variance got smaller. So this is very intuitive because the definition of the variance uh, equation just actually it's very it's it has a one over n term. And when n gets large, of course, the variance got small, the model variance got small. Um, but for a very big uh, group of models called non-parametric models, for example, Kinnear's neighbor is that type of model. Um, that type of model, when you have more training data, actually the bias also decrease. Uh, this is difficult to understand, uh, so feel free um, it just don't worry um, if you cannot understand it. If you want to learn more, uh, you can just uh, shoot me a message. I'm going to share you some readings. So um, non this is a very big topic, in fact, in non-parametric statistics. Yeah. All right, so now we know there are two things you can actually control, right? Control bias and variance trade-off. Uh, if you can order uh, complexity, and then you can use the validation curve just from the easy to the complex. Uh, if you do not, you can use the kind of learning curve by varying the training size and to see the differences of the validation curve and the, um, uh, the training curve. So now you have the means to figure out underfitting and overfitting. And uh, so what? So when you can sanity figure out what is overfitting, uh, are you or are my current setup overfitting or underfitting, then you can just react accordingly, uh, correctly. Uh, so, so very important, you need to real, you need to um, check, I mean, be quite sure. I am, I, uh, is my model overfitting or is my model underfitting? So that's the first step. Uh, and then react accordingly. Um, okay, so after you, uh, you can order that and you can always control the big range of overfitting and underfitting. And this is the easy case. All right. Using uh, this kind of uh, validation curve, you control it. You can, you can actually move from underfitting to overfitting. And th this type for this, this type of, uh, um, because you have a control, you, you have hyperparameters can control the movement uh, into under uh, from underfitting or from overfitting. And the second movement is, um, so, so how do you know underfitting? So underfitting a similar curve um, as the learning curve. So you just plot out, I mean, changing the training size, and you can see how the training curve and the testing curve um, the behave. So in those kind of uh, underfitting case, and these two curves are very close. And, and also they both are very high. So which means what? So even the training error, it's unacceptably high. And they're, they're, the training and testing are so close. And this is exactly tells you, I have a high training error and a high testing error, which means I'm in the underfitting case. And uh, how do you react for the underfitting? Because 
underfeeding is mostly caused by the buyer's errors. So you, you want to reduce the buyers. So how do you reduce buyers? Most simple case is uh, from simpler model to a uh, complex model. So for example, you initially just have maybe a linear models. You want to move to maybe this kind of basis-based regression model, like those RBF-based or polynomial regression-based. Um, and the other, uh, most people actually, when they do on real world data, just add more features. It's a very good way uh, to uh, reduce the bias. All right, so now uh, let's see uh, how do you tell, I mean, if your, your model cannot be plot in a linear uh, model complexity line, how do you tell you are overfitting? So kind of repeat, uh, same learning curve, vary the training size, plot the test error, plot the training error. So even until the largest training size you have, your training error and test error are still pretty far apart. And the training is just very, very low. The training error is super low, but the test error is high. So this is just a very apparent, it's an overfitting regime. Uh, the issue of overfitting is uh, you want to reduce variance. So now you understand. So now I'm overfitting, then let me control the variance problem. So how do you control the variance? So you can move from a complex classifier into a simpler classifier. You can also add a regularization because we told you before, right? Regularization is a very uh, effective strategy to add buyers to add because you want to make your weights more regular, uh, less, less wild. And the other uh, way, in fact, is you just get more training data. You the getting more training data is a very effective strategy to control the variance. And the other uh, is um, to just try a smaller set of feature selection. So this is a very classic way. You just try different feature selectors. And the classic machine learning and actually the feature selection step is kind of dominating, especially in the text-based uh, classification, because in the text case we told you, I mean, in the old days, um, so you have a lot, just many, many, like this kind of engram features you have compared to the features you normally in this regime uh, is the n smaller than p. So when n smaller than p, I mean, this, this type of issues, I mean, a, a selecting feature is a very good way to reduce the variance. Uh, it's adding bias, essentially. And you can also try feature engineering. What I mean meant feature engineering is maybe you can add uh, structure biases. So especially if you know my, my, my uh, maybe for my current data, uh, like a lot of those are noise and only those have a certain patterns will be, should be the good features. Then you can design mechanism to highlight, to select those good features. And the last strategy, in fact, it's a very popular dominating strategy uh, winning the Kaggle competition, which is just, you just try multiple models and then you aggregate the multiple models predictions all together. So if you think about it, I mean, this is also a clear, I mean, reducing the variance um, strategy, right? So I, I'm trying to, um, get a lot of bootstrap. If you still remember what you um, learned in the statistics class, bootstrap, I mean, if you have a more uh, more samples, it's a clear way after reducing the variance. All right, so uh, now like, let's summarize. I mean, we actually talked to you so many, like all these different kinds of curves. So what are they if we put them together? So in summary, we, uh, let we try to convince you to use three type of plots uh, when it doesn't matter what algorithm. So this is the reason why I'm having this whole section before the classification, right after regression, because this is fundamentals. So until now, I mean, regression, uh, everything we learned already tells you why this kind of curves are important. And they are actually very, very important in uh, when we move to deep learning, 
when we move to other more advanced classification algorithms, no matter how advanced they are, when you use those algorithm or write a new algorithm, you need to control control three things. So first, if that's a gradient uh, stochastic type of optimization, you really need to control um, a sanity check how your model uh, converge uh, with uh, looping over the data. The, the training and the validation laws versus the epoch can actually tell you a lot. Is my optimization good enough or not? Okay, so that's the first curve. You already uh, you ha you should ha already plot those in your homework one, and then in homework two, we ask you to plot the second and third type of plots. So the second is the validation curve. Essentially, people mostly just call that hyperprimed tuning curve. So you again, so you when you have can order your complexity into a line and you just control and move from really uh, simple version into most complex version and then to see how the training and, and the validation area uh, behaves and then using that validation to select the plateau um, plateau range of hyperparameters. So this is called validation curve. And essentially this is doing the uh, bias variance uh, trade-off control. And if you have a more complex model group and or a model class or multiple model class, how do you know you're overfitting or underfitting? And in those uh, much more complex cases, try to use this curve called learning curve. And essentially learning cur curve is what? You varying, you use part of the training data and then you vary that proportion from really small until the maximum you can use, and you have the training and loss curve plotted. So you just try, then you try to check, is my training and loss very close together? Are they both very high? If they are, you are in the underfitting regime. Uh, if they're not very close, um, their um, training area is extremely, extremely good, you are in an underfitting regime. And then you react accordingly, just like what we just uh, recommended. All right, uh, so uh, I'm going to move to a, a cell ROM uh, in my other computer. So, but before that, I will um, just show you some figures we're going to uh, read from my Jupyter notebook ROM. And also let me read my chat. Uh, so uh, there's a question is, what if our training takes a while because our training set is so large? Yes, that's actually a good question. So, uh, so I told you to control uh, to plot the learning curve, right? And but in a lot of cases, it's actually difficult because that's just so large. And in this very uh, state of the art deep learning data sets, you normally don't need to have this uh, learning curve because people just pre-assume I'm already. Um, um, it's this data is large enough and which means the variance is very nicely controlled. I hope this explains uh, what I just said. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm going to do code ROM and then show you uh, two different curves. So, but I want to uh, first clarify there are some differences. So the left validation curve is what you're going to get from scikit-learn this validation curve function. And the right, um, it's a, what we're asking you to plot. It's not uh, like two different end case. This is more like um, advanced version. If you are interested, we only ask you to plot one case, one n equal to forty, if I remember correctly, or maybe fifty. And um, but uh, I asked TA to plot you two cases just to let you, let you uh, take a look. So the x-axis in this case is the degree of polynomial curve. And it's this curve looks like very weird. I mean, first thing is, so I told you, right? I mean, so this looks, so first of all, um, the left is the score is the higher, the better. So the psychic learn normalize all the metrics into a positive range. So when the classification, they show the accuracy. Uh, one for regression, they actually show the R2. 
which is kind of uh, the correlation of my prediction versus the truth. So which means the score higher means my prediction better. So in all of the previous curves, we normally um, using the Y as uh, error. So keep that in mind. So that's why there's a valley shape, right? Um, but uh, when you use scikit-learn like and they're doing uh, in the end, it's just a flip, right? So which means it's actually a hill shape. So this type of shape is the test, um, it's this expected test error of course validation um, when you vary the complexity. All right, so let's see this uh, first. I want to pay attention to the dash lines. The dash lines is about n equals to 40. And the solid line means n equal to 300. I think that's the one. And the ISTA actually did, um, it's, it's a error curve. So in the end, it's some kind of flip, but it's a different curve. I mean, uh, we are showing you, so this is a R2 metric and this is the mean square error. So it's not completely the same here. So um, honestly, the right, it's more close to the modern deep learning library style. And the left, it's a scikit learn style. So I, yeah, but we, we, we would like you to draw the right style. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second is pay attention to this curve. One n equals to 300, and these two lines are actually very close. And one e, n equal to 40, um, we I, I'm controlling that, that degree, right? And just starting from about like d equal to 11, it's really bad. I mean, this uh, validation error already becomes very bad. But um, one similar really high degree curves, but when I have more training data, I can still fit really well. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, what I want to, again, keep in mind, there are two things you can control the bias various trade-off. First is that complexity of hyperparameter tuning. The other is the training size. When you have more training data, you have much, you can allow much more complex models. So this is more like a summary. All right. So uh, another curve, I, it's the learning curve. I'm going to show you uh, by the code round. It's more like this. So this, the upper is for the regression. We are going to read uh, just in a second. The lower is you can do the same thing for classification. So this, it's actually extremely small, the training size, right? If you look at this, this is like one, four, zero, zero, uh, like 1400 training data. And you vary from 200s to 1400. And then you can actually see, I mean, there's a pretty dramatic differences. So naive base method, they kind of converge the training and testing into the score about 0 0.85 and SVM about here. So this actually, this is like under, you can almost this. So both training and testing, they are very close. I mean, actually they're very, very similar, right? but they're all very bad. I mean, this. I think this is an accuracy score. Both string and uh, validation are, are bad, which means what? Underfitting. Yes, underfit. And then the strategy, but you cannot plot its complexity, right? but you actually now know it's underfitting, then you try a more complex model. And very clearly this complex model actually pushes both the training and validation to be much, much better. And I hope this explains about how you pinpoint underfitting, try a more complex model, and then plot all those curves together. And then you actually can conclude, yes, the previous case, my data over uh, my model overfits on that data, uh, no, underfits on that data. All right, so now let me start to do the code run. Okay, so uh, now we're in this uh, Jupyter notebook and we actually uh, run this with you before, um, but I modified it a little bit. 
So this is already shared in uh, the course slides. I, mean, I, I put the link there. You can just run by yourself. So uh, very similarly, if you still remember, um, we just uh, make a pipeline of this polynomial features. This is like polynomial regression. Then we generate data. I mean, we actually generate data. So in this case, I generate 50. So this is my first data. Remember, this is called X and Y data. And so now I'm just trying to do uh, the feeding. Uh, the feeding is you can actually just visualize eyeball. Like in fact, I mean, in the smaller uh, dimensional cases, eyeball is a very important sense to check. I mean, your, your, your human intuition actually is very good, just in summary. So you can actually tell, I mean, this degree equal to nine, kind of wild one uh, on the on the, on the boundary cases, uh, but they still should, seems to be fine I mean, uh, on the middle. All right, so now I start to plot the validation curve. I'm just using the secular model selection validation curve, and uh, I choose degree from zero to 21, and then I'm just plotting, so this uh, blue one is uh, the training score. So in this case, remember, secular uh, normalize all the scores as a positive. So it's we always use uh, arrow as the y. Here always uh, there's this more like accuracy as the y. So I actually show you here. So you can actually tell the regression scores uh, used in the secular. They normally use something called negative mean square error. So which means they always they try to just uh, normalize all of the possible scores into this positive range, which means whenever you plot it, higher the better, okay? Yeah, but in the PyTorch and in a lot of the state-of-art deep learning, it's actually the other way. Uh, we That's mostly using the error as the metrics. All right, so now we have the 50s, uh, when x equal to 50s, this validation curve, I mean, you vary the D, I mean, it's very easy, very classic. And you can actually use this to pick, I think eight is the best. Yeah, so you just use the eight and then you plot this curve. It seems to be fit good, I mean, nicely. All right, so now I'm changing my data into 200. I'm doing the same feeding and also this um, validation curve. The validation curve is obtained by cross validation seven folds, just to let you know. So in this case, and this, the second curve, this is called um, the train curve and the validation curve, it's obtained um, from the x2, y2, which is 200, I think it's 200, yeah, it's 200. And I'm also plotting the, uh, the, the train score and the validation score from before, which was 50. So you can actually tell, I mean, the, when you have only 50 samples, you cannot actually tune uh, you you just cannot um, stand with larger d but when you have more training samples in this case um, like 200 even go to 220 it doesn't it, it's still like this validation error doesn't go down right okay now let me do something i want to do something more like this i think i can hopefully uh, maybe 30 maybe 40. Oh, it doesn't allow me because my X. Okay, let me come back in this one doing a 40. So I'm going to refeed my data using 0 to 40 degree. Okay, so this is in the 40, uh, 50s uh, sample size. Uh, so this, I think I don't need to redround this and let's do 200. So in this case, is it 40? Yeah. Okay, yeah, oh my goodness, even 40, it still doesn't go down much, but it starts to going down, downward. Look at this, so before we have the 20, I mean, we're actually in this range, right? So let me try to notate. We Before we check the uh, flexibility of my model, I stopped at 20 and it just still looks my um, 20 degree uh, still really good. So who can actually tell me actually in the chat, 
y when I have n equals to, I actually had, when I have so many more training samples, and this is 200, I can train even a model like d equals to 10. Or maybe d equals to 20, I make it more dramatic which is actually very far from, seem to be really far from hopefully the truth. So you're going to observe something very similar in your, uh, in your homework. The reason why when we have more training data, we can even fit such a high degree model is even if my true D, assuming the true D, D truth, assuming it's eight, when I have enough training data, I can just set everything like D9, D10, um, to D20. I can just learn to set them zero. And this is the power. This is the power of more training data because I'm very flexible. When you give me enough training samples, I can always learn a less flexible models. And because I'm so flexible, uh, I'm more sensitive. If you have less number of training samples, my variance just kind of dominate. But when you have enough training samples, your variance got reduced a lot. And I have also smaller bias. That's why my, uh, this expected test error, it's low. So this is in fact the fundamental reason why over complete deep learning models behave so well. So in some cases, I mean, they're because so that just really grounded because uh, the state of the R training data is so huge, they can allow very flexible, humongous models. I hope this explains and uh, uh, some of your confusions about deep learning. All right, so uh, let me clean this up, and then I have something like a learning curve to show you. So uh, and then let's just. Uh, do that learning curve, assuming we cannot control, assuming we, I cannot control my model, I, I'm trying to, uh, I cannot control the degree. I'm just trying to compare a degree one model versus degree nine model, all right? So uh, in this one, I mean, you can actually tell in the degree one model. Uh, yeah, in the degree one model, so you can actually tell both the training and testing uh, te and the validation, they are pretty bad. I mean, their their range is about here, 0 0.6. They're also pretty close. So what does that mean? I actually did something before. I mean, it's I'm comparing two models using this learning curve. And um, one of them is, I mean, their training and testing are very close. They are both very bad. The score is only 0 0.6. So there, apparently, this is underfitting, underfit. So when you move to a much more complex models, so you can actually tell uh, the complex model did really badly when you have smaller training data. But when you just gradually, when you have more training data and it kind of moved up, it just behaves better and better. And in all of the cases, the training error is super small. So this part, it's a very apparent regime overfitting, right? I hope this explains what is, just give you um, more like a guidance of, yeah, so this range is overfitting. To draw there. Yeah, so this overfit. The training era, it's just so small. The training score is so good. The validation is so bad, so apparently overfit. But gradually, when you have more training data, you actually start to do really, really well. And this is the other way to control bias variance trade-off. I think this is all I want to talk about uh, module one. Let me stop share. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I have one more to show you. Yes, I made an even more dramatic case. Okay, so so in this one, I actually try to show you 
is a degree two versus degree nineteen, and on um, the this is on this forty data x and y. So let's remember this uses x y to do the uh, learning curve plotting, and this one uses x two and y two, which has much more uh, data and equal to two hundred. So this actually is very dramatic. So when you have d equal to degree really bad, and this just they're so bad. Uh, first of all, yeah. So why does this? Oh, I did not. Okay, let me actually control this. So let me set about uh, like zero point seven six. Okay. Yeah, I'm controlling the Y. Wow. Okay, so. Maybe I should use 0 0.5. Okay, so so actually, I think maybe you can start to tell this. I'm using a very dramatic degree equal to 19. So I have 200 data, but very apparently one degree to 19, my, I cannot even observe my validation error within the good range, which means what? So even though I have a lot of data, this still overfits. So one degree to 19, even if I have 200 data, this overfits. But when I have degree to 9, and around the 40 and then go a little bit long, they don't overfit. So this is actually trying to tell you, in the end, the complexity and data size is a coupled factor. And deciding when do you overfit or when do you underfit, it's not just one thing. Um, it's not just I vary the degree, I can control overfit, underfit. You really need to consider the training size. All right. So I hope this is a good um, presentation about explaining uh, the bias variance trade-off and um, the how do you control it, how do you pinpoint it.